Bonjour, chers collègues. Je suis ici encore pour parler de l'importance d'intégrer le genre dans tous les aspects de la prise de décision dans la OSCE. Now, it seems like I'm always standing up here trying to do exactly that. Um, and yet it seems to me that we are perhaps regressing. I don't like to think we are, but I, I, I want to point out that in the summer, um, I touched on the issue of migrants and refugees, and I think this is something that we need to focus on. And so when I gave you a lot of data in the summer about how women and girls and children actually fare as migrants, I thought I would lay that down so that we can build on what we actually do about it, how we move forward on dealing with this issue. And I was a little disappointed that in December, uh, in Hamburg, when the foreign ministers met, and they discussed, amongst other things, the issue of migrants and refugees. The word woman, women, was mentioned three times. One, in relation to the role of women in terrorism and violent extremism, and twice in relation to the role of women with small arms and light weapons. Nor that, where did we talk about, did that ministerial council talk about the role of women in peace? And we know that the United Nations is pushing very clearly for us to look at the 1325 and the role of women in peace, in building peace, the role of women in preventing conflict, the role of women in, in fact, rebuilding post-conflict societies. And yet, that was not mentioned. The, this, these are things that women can do that will enhance security. And so, the OSCE, as we know, everyone talked about the role of the OSCE in security, but we didn't talk very much about the role of the OSCE in cooperation in looking at building democratic institutions as a means of creating cooperation and in looking at the issue of human rights within that cooperative aspect. We know from studies and experience of the security issues of men and women and boys and girls are very different. Uh, we've talked about that. I laid down all the data for that in the last meeting that we had here. And so I was disappointed to see that we, we the 57 nation states, ignored 51% of our societies. How do you build peaceful societies if you ignore over a half of that society and their ability to form attachments uh, in that society, feel secure, to be trusting, and to build loyalty to the host society? I think these are, these are integral to dealing with creating peaceful societies. Now, on the, the 24th Ministerial Council will be in Vienna in December the, the 24th of the 20, 2017, and I want to strongly urge, and I'm asking you as members of parliament, to urge your own ministers, your own foreign ministers in your nation states, to actually start to join the mainstream, to actually talk about the role of that 51% of our populations in moving to meet our, all of our objectives. I want you to insist on it at your government levels. And I want to thank Austria for its commitment uh, as 2017 chairperson uh, to commitment to the issue of gender. And I just wanted to point out actually a little bit uh, bragging uh, that, that three people who are speaking today are women. Isn't that wonderful? I don't think we would have seen that here a few years ago. I want to just actually focus on one thing today, and that is uh, uh, the aspect of integration in refugees and migrants that come to our host countries. We know that hundreds of thousands of people have come to Europe and Canada and continue to do so around all of the 57 nation states. They bring with them their women who come as parts of families and their single women who bring with them their children. And we know, as we said last time, that they face a lot of problems in terms of identity, being able to identify themselves as individuals, being able to have access to many of the things like safe housing, health care, etc. These are really important pieces. And we talked today, and I wanted to, I picked up on some things that, that the, um, the our Austrian Madame Bure said, and we talked, uh, Christina talked about, and we talked about this ability to understand that if we want to build strong and secure societies in our own nations, we need to be able to ensure that newcomers to those societies feel that they are safe, that they're secure, that they're welcome 
so that they can develop attachments to those communities. And developing attachments means developing loyalty. And we know that some of the things that we need to do to ensure that that happens is to focus on issues. And I think we've identified this very clearly, that language is the first bit. If you have people who come, they cannot speak the language of the host community, and the host community doesn't understand their language, that's the first thing to isolation, the first way that we allow people to become, to go back into, into their little corners and not, and not integrate in society. Child care is a very important aspect as women are getting training when they come into host societies as migrants, and as women are beginning to learn the language of that country, they need somebody to look after their kids so that they can have access to employment eventually. Um, those are very important pieces of integrating in society. We're, look, we're looking at the issue of access to health care and many health issues because people are coming from societies in which they have been very traumatized. And children and young people especially are traumatized by their experiences. And so mental health issues are very, very important. And I think we want to look at the issue of gender-based violence where we know, and I can tell you that around the world, and Canada is not immune from it, we see women who come from places like Syria and from other countries with different cultures who are afraid to go out into society because if they wear a hijab or they wear a niqab or they wear a scarf, they're terrified that people are going to pick on them. And so they stay in their homes, increasing the isolation and the lack of ability to in integrate. Human rights reports, actually, that there's some very important things that we need to look at as we integrate women and children into host societies. One is to ensure that they have legal status. And this is something that's very difficult to achieve for women and children who are especially lone women. To look at access to education, to housing, to training, and to employment so that they can integrate better into societies. And to look at the issue of family reunification wherever necessary. As we bring in migrants and refugees into our country, we need to ensure that we look at vulnerable communities and bringing families together and integrating families because we all know from every country we come from that the family is at the heart of how we feel safe and how we build a new society. And so I want to focus on three of these areas very quickly uh, in terms of looking at integration and one of them is creating social networks. And I'm going to refer to something that we have learned in Canada. We learned this in 1978 when we brought in 60,000 Vietnamese and Cambodians. We called them the boat people because they came in these little fishing boats all the way up to Canada. And we couldn't send them back, obviously. And so we had the problem of integrating people who did not speak a language that any of us, or very few of us, understood in Canada, and people who were very scared and very traumatized. And what happened was that communities, the government was sort of trying to figure out what to do and communities in Canada spoke out, churches and, and uh, NGOs and uh, villages and cities spoke up and groups said, we wanted to get some of these people into our countries. We want to bring them into our communities. We want to integrate them. We want to be responsible for families and for individuals. And so, so began something that Canada now does, is which we have, as part of our refugee and immigrant uh, governance, we actually have government and refugees that governments are responsible for. And now we have something called private sponsorship in Canada, where these groups who have been actually given uh, sort of the ability to function because government has checked that they are bona fide groups, are able to bring in uh, refugees and immigrants. Since 30 years ago, these private sponsorship groups have bought in 288,000 refugees that they've been responsible for. And it's turned out that, in fact, the private sponsors have been better at integrating than governments. Government provides the usual things, housing, uh, financial support, food, etc. These communities provide mentorship. They provide integration. They invite these families to barbecues in their backyard. They meet the community. They learn to speak English. They take them shopping. They teach them how, how the system works, how to get a bus. All of these things really create integration. And we can look back 30 years ago and look at the Vietnamese refugees, and we've done enough studies on them by university groups and, and everyone who have actually found out that these young people integrated completely into our society to the extent that they completed post-secondary education and secondary education more so than people in, in Canadian society. And they have become leaders in the political sphere, in economics, and in, in, in the social and cultural part of our country. So this is something I want to bring to you because
because I think there's much to learn from that experience where government doesn't have to take on the complete burden of looking after refugees. In fact, we found that these sponsorship groups bring in more refugees than the government itself. And so, talk about best practices, let's look at these best practices. Because the, the most important piece, though, is looking at the cultural identity as part of integration. And we know that women are responsible for families. Women are responsible for making sure that families uh, integrate, to make sure that their kids grow up to be feeling safe in a community. And so women are very clearly the people we need to look for when we try to get that integration, that sense of feeling comfortable and at home, and being able to feel a loyalty to our host community. So one of the things we can do, not only in the private sponsorship, is to make sure that women have female caseworkers, um, and that women have female mentors. And if you can find from the host, from the migrant society, people who speak their language, who can mentor them, that also is very practical and helping. And I think these are the practical things we need to do if we want to integrate and have stable societies. Our Prime Minister in Canada, who supports and has increased by 20% the number of migrants and refugees we are going to be bringing into Canada, has actually felt that, that in fact diversity is our strength. The fact that we have different people from different countries who speak different languages, who uh, have different religious backgrounds, who have different religious, have different cultures, has made Canada a strong place. A place where everybody feels at home and they can take that out there and look at how we can get global and peaceful reconciliation to many of our problems that we face at the moment. But integration is a two-way street. We need the immigrants and the refugees to integrate into society, so we need to be able to give them the tools to do so. Language is one of them. The other thing is the host community needs to be welcoming, and private sponsorship and government helping with languages and employment and training is one, and accommodation is one way to do it. And I want to quote, integration refers to a two-way process in which the newcomer becomes a member of the new community, and the new community adapts to receive newcomers as full members in successful integration. Where Refugees are able to contribute their gifts and skills, become self-reliant, and a new multicultural community is formed. And we have learned that in Canada, that this is so true. Uh, it is very true, and we are a very safe and a secure country in many ways because we have been doing this. Obviously, there are going to be a few exceptions to the rules, but we have found that young people, especially youth, and somebody talked about it, when they are not welcomed into a society and they become isolated, they begin to dislike the society intensely and want to actually create violence within that society, and that is one of the root causes of, of extremism. We have choices here as a parliament, parliamentary assembly. We are political leaders. We can choose to integrate, to welcome, to build relationships with newcomers and with refugees and immigrants, or we can choose to be isolationist and nationalistic. We have seen in the past, in our own history, um, going way back to world wars, that isolationism and fear of the other does not breed anything other than war and conflict. Let us look at how we create peaceful societies around the world. Migrants and refugees are not going to go away. This is not a crisis anymore. This is going to be a way of life as we see Climate change and poverty move people from Africa and poor countries into countries like ours. As we see conflicts which are rising every day in this world, moving people and women and children. So I ask you to be bold. I ask you to speak up. I ask you to speak up in your parliaments. I ask you to talk to your governments and your foreign ministers. And let us begin to see a new way of looking at things. Integration is important, and let us gen do gender-based analysis and gender mainstreaming in everything that we do. Thanks very much.